everybody we have a great guest for you today jim glazer aka costume jim who is the uh, creator of costume cult making regular appearances as burning man new york city just some background on me uh obviously i've been doing a lot in arts and culture leading costume cult which is a nonprofit called costume cultural society i also started another nonprofit called action arts league which was a league of action oriented artists so that was a very um, activistic oriented project, which ultimately launched uh, the Figment Festival, which uh, sort of Burning Man for kids and families. Uh, it was on New York's Governor's Island, which is just moving to Roosevelt Island this year. And that's now in actually 18 cities around the world. So that was a, uh, a, a serious nonprofit that we put together. I ultimately left the board because I'm uh, a little too edgy uh, for some of our fundraising uh that, mm -hmm. that's a fun story um uh, and oh well, yeah and also i'm a i'm a cat lover so here we go Aww. here's my, here's my uh Aww. here's so, jules has a couple of cats running <laughs> around mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah we uh we adopted uh two kittens right after the trump election because my girl's german she really doesn't want to be here in the first place. And I really just needed to like change the subject. So kittens, uh, kittens really helped it. Uh, we, you know, wedded doubt, uh, 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 kitten videos, kittens. And uh, yeah, so that was that. And really at this point, um, uh, my strong suit is arts and culture advocacy. But because my background is CEO level executive headhunting, I um, uh, really understand business and business models. I did a lot of work for venture capital firms, and uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of the nonprofit model anymore. That inevitably becomes all about fundraising all the time. So the startup that we're developing, a socially conscious startup, uh, will be more of a B Corp or um, low profit LLC or something that is social good but profitable with a bit of capitalism in it, because really the A talent, uh, you know, gravitates towards the profit motive and uh, nonprofit, a lot of nice people there, but you know, the, the pure raw brain power uh, is, is more in the for-profit sector. So lots to talk about between arts and culture, business models. And one of the things we're talking about is a, a uh, costume shop in downtown New York City with a reality show in it, fully mm -hmm. wired for all sorts of content capture, long form, short form, uh, DIY, humor, etc. cetera. So uh, if we're talking about um, you guys and your podcast and uh, doing good for the world, uh, uh, you know, let's have a good conversation. Sounds good to me. So Costume Cult throws the greatest parties in the history of New York. Uh, that is, if if you like fun, if you like costumes, if you like a uh, welcoming environment, um, if you like kittens, you you gotta like cats to be in costume cult. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, maybe not. Uh, but uh, we throw uh, you know smaller events like 200 people is what our uh, Oscar party was at the National Arts Club this year, and we also. Uh, throw you know thousand person twelve hundred person uh, costume galas, and then we're also uh, sort of the largest float in the New York Halloween Parade, Coney Island Mermaid Parade, uh, and a few others, Dance Parade, Gay Pride Parade. Uh, so we we utilize uh, the public space for art because when you're artists uh, in New York City, usually the problem is funding things and renting spaces and uh you ain't gotta rate rent the public space so we're really good at that and um we've done a lot of things in terms of flash mobs and costume actions and and so forth over the years when you say costume actions what do you mean oh uh i mean the whole um the whole uh flash mob thing where you know it was really in the in the 2000s where you know all of a sudden people would show up and do crazy shit and then leave and it was like a media action a lot of that came because SantaCon started to take off which while we'll never admit to it um 
uh, we may or may not have had something to do with that. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, the Cacophony Society is a very much where Costume Cult came from. Cacophony Society was the group out of San Francisco that made Burning Man cool. They're the ones who did the crazy shit. And, uh, you know, there were some great people who set up the event. And then there were some less known people who came and made the event awesome. And a lot of them were culture jammers, artists, and just like, you know, lunatics that made you just go, holy crap, I can't believe I just saw that. So uh, there is a Cacophony Society Brooklyn was very much part of this at the very beginning. SantaCon was a Cacophony Society thing that started in San Francisco. My favorite event to this day is something called the Idiot Arad, uh, Idiot Arad. It is a, uh, a an absurdist sharping cart race in Brooklyn, usually in um, January, where uh, it's like the Alaskan Iditarod, but instead of dog sleds on the frozen Alaskan tundra, it is shopping carts and costume human <laughs> uh, running from bar to bar um, and blowing the minds of everybody who encounters us. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, what is art? What is creativity? Uh, you know, you, you make art to be seen mostly, not to hide it all in your in your studio. That's true. You know, when in an media empowered age and when we're in New York City making art to, uh, you know, show off and be awesome and, and uh, is what we do. And we have taken particular uh, uh, pride in uh, sort of the uh, one of the backbones of participatory culture, the you know the Burning Man, uh, uh, radical inclusion. Uh, we like to include people. We invite people from all walks of life, and very specifically, helping ordinary people be creative. Uh, a lot of people go to art school, and you know that's what you know art is: fine art, art you can sell. But really. Um, creative lifestyles, especially in uh, an environment where income inequality is sort of making like no more middle class. So how do you give people fulfillment on a low budget? And as somebody who left corporate, uh, left a nice cushy six figure lifestyle, I make a fraction of what I made and I have much more fun. I found my people and that's because of I live a creative lifestyle and I found a community of people that supports that. That's amazing. And to do it in a place like New York city as well, with the rent getting as high as we were talking about before, that's really tough, but because uh, you're able to get affiliated with all these awesome people and to make all these friendships, you find that people are there at the end of the day who are helping you out and the community is growing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, we talked, you guys mentioned Bitcoin for a second there. And a big part of who we have been has been about decentralized community building. From the very beginning, uh, we were doing that without knowing that that was a word that was going to become all the rage. And uh, how do you, you know, it, a lot of creative organizations like theater, you know, has kind of what I call the diva model. There is a creative director who's the boss and it's a top-down thing, and then people work for them, and they, you know, maybe they get paid. Um, but when you're an all-volunteer arts collective, you have your 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 um, currency is uh, inspiration and inclusion and empowering people, and you don't do that in a top-down way. At least none, nobody that I'm working with really. Um, so you you've got to be decentralized. You've got to uplift people. And right now, uh, you know, Custom Cult always had that on the drawing board. We were always going to develop into a flat committee structure. But for the longest time, uh, it was a, a, a sort of enlightened dictatorship where we would have the language of middle out, but it, you know, sort of fake it till you make it. You, 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 you tried to empower people, but if they'd rather go bicycling on a sunny Sunday, and weren't doing the work, then, you know, the, the main people had to take over again. But mm -hmm. now, here we are in, in, in uh, 
in 2019, the committee structure in Costume Cult is really taken over. Uh, the transition is on its way. We have such skilled people um, stepping up now. I really feel like it took uh, it took a long time. Costume Cult's been around since 2001. And this is the year that we really turn the turn the corner. How large is your team at Costume Cult? Um, <laughs> when I first started this whole thing, I, I read an article on how to make a one man operation look like a major corporation. So uh, say we a lot and uh, and CC everybody <laughs> and all the things mm -hmm. and uh, fake it till you make it credo. Um, but then, uh, uh, so we have about 10,000 people in our Facebook group. We have about 200 people that camp with us year, every year at Burning Man. Usually 200 people show up every time we have a float in the Halloween parade. Um, but right now, maybe 50 people who came to, probably about 60 people came to the the uh, the people power meeting we just had, which was you know a better word than human resources, <laughs> where uh, people were broken up into marketing committee, uh, decor committee. Um, I mean, there's just all the things. The camp committee is really vibrant, uh, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, I mean, th there's a core leadership team of about ten people that just get together and their their job is to elevate people and get them involved. Um, so think of it more of as a hub, a middle out hub rather than a top down boss scene. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say, you know, ask me next week, I'll give you a different number than this week. Hmm. Do you have, do you have permanent offices throughout the year or do you rent spaces depending on a busy period? Like right before Burning Man, you'll get rework offices or is there like a full year um, operation? Uh, no, no, we don't spend money on uh, office space. Uh, optimally, we, we would love to find uh, various people will donate space and so forth. Actually, our biggest issue now is just to find um, uh gallery spaces or basements or whatever where we can make art and keep art so we don't have to keep humping things in and out uh but yeah we're we're pan new york area and then when you think about our costume uh cults camp at burning man we're national even international with people uh really uh, operating in a virtual way are you familiar with uh, robot heart at Burning Man? Oh yeah, know the guys well. Uh, collaborated with them. Um, I mean, Costume Cult has been the man behind the curtain on practically every New York area camp. Uh, Robot Heart is, uh, sort of came from two places, the Pink Pussy Cat Posse and Disorient, both uh, close friends of mine. And uh, just, you know, a little bit more on that. When I, was jumping from costume cult, which was the sort of cool adult party collective to action arts league, um, where it was much more of a, a more mainstream nonprofit model. I made it my business to know everybody in the New York burning man community, uh, the wealthy and the poor Brooklyn artists. And, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, robot heart more comes from the, uh, the, the former, the more moneyed uh, side. Uh, and yeah, I partied with those guys, gone to their parties, been on their bus at Burning Man. Um, uh, they haven't done a lot in New York lately, but yeah, cer certainly know them pretty well. I don't, I don't know if, uh, this is the correct comparison to make, but from a lot of what I've seen about Burning Man and I really want to go in the future, but just as a sa side observer, it reminds me a lot of the uh, mystery cults that used to exist uh, back in the ancient times, where people, regardless of whether they were uh, free or slaves, uh, and I believe men or women, they would gather together and go through this process of, in a way, being reborn, where they would go through these trials and come out of those trials as if they became a new person, and now they have a bond that they share with the rest of the community. Do you see something like that happening at Burning Man? And if not, what do you think is needed to reactivate something like that? So uh, mystery cult, uh, very interested, big fan of cults. 
Uh, <laughs> Boston cult is spelled with a K because it's a joke. It's not really a cult, but mm. uh, I mean, it's kind of like summer camp, right? Uh, you, you go to summer camp and you end up with friends for life. Um, our friends for life are some of the greatest artists in the world, some of the most powerful business people and some of the most insane underground artists. So, uh, and there is a, uh, for some of us, not everybody, but for some of us, there is a bond that, uh, that means something. You walk into a room, you know that these are burners. It immediately, uh, it lightens the mood. And I cannot tell you how many times uh, I deal with people that haven't been to Burning Man. Maybe they talk about they like it, but you just quickly get into a a, a, a normie paradigm, <laughs> Muggle paradigm, where you know it just it's just back to the what are you doing for me, uh, quid pro quo conversation that I generally don't get into with somebody who's a passionate burner. Usually you, you go through the love for a little bit longer. Obviously there's business pressures and we're, you know, out, outside of the dust, we're looking to get things done. But, um, but yeah, it, you know, uh, a, a club that brings people together that has the same values. I don't know if that's what mystery cult was, but that's what this is. And it actually, sort of makes me think of a discussion we were having in New York for a long time uh, where there was kind of the undergrounder faction and then the participate participate faction or the radical inclusion faction. And this is a long time debate in let's call it cool culture, right? So, and I go back a bit. So, you know, very, earliest days, Studio 54 and, you know, Lower East Side, like after, after hours parties, save the robots, a few of these things. And there was a certain sense that once the Jersey people started showing up, uh, your, your thing wasn't cool anymore. So the term bridge and tunneler is what the term was back then. Now, now you come over the bridge to get, you know, now Brooklyn is the epicenter, Long Island City. But uh, and then there's Burning Man, radical inclusion, where we want people to come in and help keep the culture growing and changing with new ideas. So I'm on the side of radical inclusion um, until the point where everybody is standing there wearing their backwards baseball caps um, because then they're changing the nature of our culture they, you know, they got to get on board with what we're doing, not just show up and, you know, look at us like uh, we're the monkeys in the cage. <laughs> I, uh, I, I definitely agree with that, uh, with that notion. I want to be very uh, inclusive with anybody who wants to interact with uh, Jules and I, as far as the uh, platform that we're building up right now. And one thing that I'd say is very important in the long run, as far as our uh, civilization being able to survive and thrive, is the cultivation of wisdom. And that's one thing that I'm very curious about, what exactly happens in Burning Man as far as like, you have your artists, you have people who build these gigantic vehicles that are not legal to drive on normal city streets, and it's supposed to be that way, and you get this giant dude who gets burned at the end of the uh, event. But as far as people passing on knowledge to each other, like if somebody discovered something or if somebody read an interesting book, how much of that do you see being passed on? And were there any particular breakthroughs that you've noticed in Burning Man and the Burning Man culture that uh, came from something like that? Um, it's just a funny story. Um, uh, you know, when you go to basketball games and you see, uh, they shoot t-shirts, uh, with a, with a, sh a gun, mm -hmm. um, out at, uh, at the crowd. Well, I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg, but there's a joke at Burning Man, um, that, uh, the, 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 the generally, uh, you know, the, the dudes who walk around with no teeth, I mean, there's a nudity, a lot of nudity at Burning Man, which is neither here nor there. It's kind of like, we, you know, I feel European, it's, it's no big deal, but there's a joke about, um, what we call the shirt cockers, 
um, the guys who wear t-shirts and no pants. And the first, <laughs> the first time I saw that the the t-shirt gun that you see everywhere at, at like sporting events is these dudes who invented um, the pant zooka. And they were sitting there <laughs> shooting boxer shorts at dudes that were shirt cocking. So amazing. Um, so possibly not the example you were looking for, but no, that's brilliant. That's Da Vinci in action. <laughs> is that what's on your shirt? That look is that Icarus or is that a Da Vinci design or? Yeah. So um, a Burning Man has a theme every year, and um, Da Vinci's uh, uh, laboratory or, or Da Vinci's uh, da, yeah Leonardo Da Vinci was a theme for Burning Man. And one of the things I do within Costume Cult is I I am the you know creative director, um, which doesn't mean it's a top down. I, I sort of ride the crew to you know come up with the best ideas. And the Da Vinci theme was one of the more awesome themes at Burning Man. And the first thing that came to mind was uh, Da Vinci's wings. So this T-shirt, as you can see, artfully puts the man logo with Da Vinci's wings. And we made it into a t-shirt and um, also the necklaces that we make. Uh, I'm also um, a necklace, uh, 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 a pendant designer that this isn't one of mine, but this is the type of thing people give you at Burning Man. Um, mm. And one of my prouder artistic achievements is there was recently a, uh, a Burning Man art exhibit in the Smithsonian, the Renwick Gallery, where three of my pendant designs uh, ended up at the Smithsonian. So, amazing! Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see some of your pendants. Yeah, there's a book, uh, Jewelry Makers of the of Burning Man, and we've uh, a little sub community has has formed around that. And one of the more fulfilling or fun days at Burning Man is there's always a meetup where you sort of go in with a pocket full of your own pendants and you come come out with like a massive amount of bling <laughs> on you. Mm. So it's the ultimate gifting culture. No money is al allowed there. Um, you know, there used to be a barter culture, uh, which doesn't really exist. Now we just really gift it. When, and, uh, and, and giving of art, giving of pendants is one of the main ways it manifests. Do you imagine something like that could be transferred to, I'm talking like maybe 20 years from now into the future for let's say the rest of society, as far as coming up with ways of getting paid that's not exactly traditional, but at the same time wouldn't result in societal collapse? Well, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, with the wealth disparity problem and uh, it has to be solved, but Ultimately, where the world needs to go is the siphoning off of major chunks, you know, the majority of wealth off the planet to out to the Caymans mm. um, is, is going to be a problem that needs to be solved before we can evolve as a people. But I'm sort of very, um, I've sort of seen this trend for a long time, knowing that robotics and, uh, uh, AI was going to solve a lot of the problems of just how do you get food from the farm to the table? Uh, there's just less people is needed to feed and clothe people. So, uh, and it's interesting, you know, people that are, are really at the, at the forefront of this do see an age where we go beyond the need for a 40 hour work week. And we get to a point where there's a lot of free time and quite frankly, uh, it'll be a it'll become about festival culture and gaming, um, if we can get through the uh, the environmental apocalypse and 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 solve the wealth disparity issue. So, gifting culture, uh, making art to give to each other. Uh, I think uh, the minimum basic income needs to well almost eventually has to be enacted, uh, and to do that the siphoning off of just insane amounts of money to people who will never, ever spend it. Um, it just has to be changed because when you get to driverless cars and so many other things, there's just going to be full automation of the processes 
and either the profits are just going to keep going to the same people who who buy islands or it's going to be funneled back into minimum basic income where people will have the resources you know not to get a boat but to you know feed themselves and make art and you know go to parades and uh, arguably from a happiness quotient you know right now they even say people between like 70 and 100 grand are the happiest um so if we could just get to the type of lifestyle you can have for that you know with healthcare paid for and so forth then i do see uh, a natural transition to you know participatory art culture gifting culture and so forth i hope we're not going to have to uh be in that situation where a ton of rich people put their uh, money in the Cayman Islands and uh, not have it be brought back into the economy. The only thing that I'm thinking about regarding this is if they know that there's going to be a change coming where they're not going to be allowed to put their money there, they could just go to China. They could just go to some other country, which will give them complete free reign to do whatever they want. So since we're not living in a vacuum, we are going to have to contend with how exactly do we make sure that there's enough investment going into this country. And even more importantly, I think the folks you just mentioned right now, like those earning $100,000, like $500,000, even millions of dollars, Right now, a lot of those folks, if I'm not mistaken, they're the ones who end up getting stuck without the uh, high-powered lawyers that figure out various loopholes so that they don't have to pay taxes. And they're the ones who end up getting the brunt of it, which I definitely am not a fan of. Yeah, capitalism was a good idea and then uh, in a pure form, and then people just figured out how to game the system. And you know, who the figured out how to game who figured out how to game the system. The accountants and the lawyers that are payable by the richer people while the people the, writing the laws. Uh, the lobbyists, the accountants, and the lawyers. No, the the people writing the laws were bought by uh well, capitalism isn't capitalism anymore because right. uh uh you know, for example, uh when the banks almost um collapsed the economy we realized that it was socialized banking system, i.e. they could risk as much as they want and then we would still back them up. So there was a safety net for the banks. Um, there wasn't a safety net for all the people. And, you know, with 45% of the people le believing a lot of the propaganda and thinking that socialized healthcare will somehow um, send us to the dark ages when all of Europe, I mean, and and a lot of like countries even like like Cuba, have better healthcare than us. Then really, it's about truth and sunlight, and you know the you know the plus is we're getting through all the social media evils right now. People that are really good at gaming the old capitalist system are now gaming the social media system, but it is still connecting the world in a way where there is going to be sunlight. So. Um, people are not happier because they make more decimal points. People are happier because they're happy. So how do we get to a focus on happiness? And it's why I pretty much dedicated my life to arts and culture, because I have seen it change people's lives. I have seen the type of people who vibe along those lines find each other. And then, quite frankly, they can wall each other. They can wall themselves off from the idiocy that goes on to a certain extent. And it would just be nice if we could have the type of healthcare the Scandinavian countries have. I definitely think we need to lower the prices and crush the prices. And it's so weird to me when I hear certain things are cheaper in Canada. Or I hear these anecdotes of Cuba has better better health care than we do or Scandinavia. And I think that there is a lot of opportunity to talk about these things and to break them down and to figure out what is the best way. Because I think you're in a similar boat as me as far as you're, you're passionate about the future, you're passionate about technology. Like you want to see these things come to fruition. You want to help other people and you want to help yourself, right? Because if other people are able to benefit from affordable health care, and if other people are able to benefit 
from these innovations, you are going to benefit from these innovations. And if other people aren't benefiting from these innovations, you're never going to benefit from these innovations. So I believe that you care, like Richard Dawkins wrote The Selfish Gene, and he always laments and says he wishes he had given it a different title. He says he wishes he had called it the selfish gene drives the altruistic vehicle, right? As in through like altruism comes from self-interest, right? Like I, I watched this Bill Gates animation where he says like, you know, it's actually logical to care about how people are doing in Africa because the better the world is over there, like, it accelerates our society. It uplifts more people, more value starts to be put into our system. And I feel like when people talk about the economy, this is what happens. We talk about wealth, right? Like someone has a lot of wealth and a lot of money, right? But how much value exists in the system, I think is more important. Like we don't necessarily need more wealth in the system, we need more value in the system, right? For example, if you have drones that are planting trees, mm. feeding people, delivering items, there's a lot of value being created there, right? Money is just credit that represents human value, mm -hmm. right? Which is why I'm so passionate about cryptocurrency, right? So I know Costume Cult is working on something called like the cult coin or the costume coin or something and i and oh, yeah, i and i uh, the greatest most valuable uh cryptocurrency that you will probably never hear of but mark my words it is valuable uh i am i am close with the leaders of consensus uh and i was interviewing for a while for a global culture role around decentralized community building um and then the crypto winter hit so uh, you know, I haven't followed up with them in a few months, but I get it. Uh, I, I do believe in getting outside of the current banking system, which does uh, allow the uh, people with all the wealth to continue hoarding. So, yeah, I, I, I think we need to break it down and we've got to get outside of labels. We've got to get away from the propagandists who say things like the word communism and socialism are innately evil because power hungry people took those words and used them for power and rather than what they were meant for. And, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was younger at Nostradamus's, you know, future is that man will go through a time of strife. There will be a time of war. And then if they get through that time, then there will be a blossoming. There will be the creative. There will be the golden age of mankind. And I think the golden age of mankind, I hope it'll happen. Uh, I believe uh, Ralph Nader and Florida possibly made that m never happen. But I have uh, fingers crossed and I will do everything I can to bring on the golden age of mankind when it'll be a time of arts and culture and collaboration, not about the profit motive, because the profit motive does not make people happy. Interesting. I think you're right about the profit motive being a very empty, um, high ideal. And I find a lot of people, you know, it, I, I once read a book called uh, The Zappos Experience. Or something like that. It was a uh, the autobiography by the CEO of Zappos, and he yes. talks about his experience of making a company, and how at the end he was like, "I'm not even happy. Like I, like I just sold a billion dollar company, and I'm not even happy." And then he started talking about Maslow's hierarchy, and how um, he talked about three types of happiness. The first level of happiness is that rock star happiness. It's the immediate gratification. I need this now and then I'll be happy. And then the second level of happiness is being a part of something larger than yourself. It's the, uh, you're a part of a soccer team or it's a school alma mater, or it's, uh, uh, you know, you, you won an award or you have a certificate or you're part of a club. And then the, that's 
a higher form of happiness and it's more sustainable, but it still plateaus at a certain point. And the third level of happiness and the only sustainable form of happiness, the one that rejuvenates itself, is a sense of higher purpose. And traditionally, people get a sense of higher purpose from religion. But I'm, a, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist transhumanist. And so I believe in science. And I believe that you can give yourself a sense of higher purpose, right? If you just look at religions as thought technologies, and if people say, religion is the smile on a dog's face, right? Which I always thought was a funny idiom, right? Religion mm -hmm. is the smile on a dog's face. But if you look at religions as thought technologies and you're like, wow, that person's glowing. Why are you glowing so much? And they're like, oh, because I believe in reincarnation or an afterlife or a Scientology or uh, Gnosticism or whatever my religion is, right? And you're like, hmm, well, there's something in that thought technology that's making you radiant and optimistic and, and, and self-uplifting and you're uplifting people around you. I feel like a science-minded person could design for themselves a thought technology that maximizes their own happiness and well-being and maximizes the happiness and well-being of people around you. And then therefore they maximize your happiness in a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So if you could create and cultivate a thought technology that not only maximizes your happiness, but the happiness of people around you, then suddenly you get to start enjoying a positive feedback loop. Right. Yeah, well, and I feel like the Tony, uh, uh, the founder of Zappos is a guy named Tony Shea. Uh, he is uh, a Burning Man guy. And after he sold his company, he set about trying to burnify Las Vegas. So they called the Downtown Alliance uh, and um, funding projects and so forth. So uh, he gets it. And Zappos definitely helped define the internet. Who knew that people, uh, the, the thought was, oh, people aren't going to want to buy shoes online. They need to try them on. No, they don't. <laughs> they just need them there quickly. Um, so, uh, so yeah, Tony wins, and thankfully, he's one of the people that uh, believed in participatory culture and tried to bring it to a soulless place like Las Vegas, where a number of my friends actually have moved since then, and they are uh, helping to build out aspects of. And it's not even burner culture anymore. It's it's participatory culture, maker culture, or what I call conscious creative culture. Um, that's really the game now. And uh, yes, I believe so there's definitely technical solutions uh, because science and uh, innovation is part of this. And that's part of creative culture because uh, developing new things is very creative. So we need to get our brains together, get outside of the propaganda, um, uh, military industrial complex, uh, negative feedback loop and move forward to the golden age of mankind, um, through the water wars and all the things that are coming. And we have to get to that place where, um, we are, we are, uh, now living in a sustainable way. It would be good if more people understood not just that there's a fun event, but that it is in fact an art form, a participatory cultural art form where yes, we're having fun at an event, but through the content and the media, we're also showing what this lifestyle is all about and, and broadcasting it um, through social media so that much wider uh, target audience sees it, hears it, wants to get involved, and this is how we change uh, perceptions such that people will want to do it themselves. And then we can bring this um, consciousness to the greater public and make this more part of the future. The participatory culture reminds me of uh, those participation trophies I used to get at Cavaliers. I used to do an after school program in New York, uh, sports stuff, and they would they we would all get participatory trophies. Ah, yes, <laughs> lovely millennials. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody is a winner.
Yay. Well, I, I was also a triathlete in high school. So I was also, so I also did win some real awards, but it was like, <laughs> I had, I was much older and I was looking at my trophy collection and I was like, half of these, I didn't even win. And so I threw those out. Mm, yeah. But the ones that I did win, I kept. That I, talks a lot about incentive. Like if somebody gets something that they know that they put in a lot of time into and they get rewarded by that, it keeps them wanting to do it even more so. So that's kind of like a balance that I think we're going to have to achieve as we keep going to the future where, you know, we want everybody to have the, you know, minimum amount of stuff so that they could live a good life so that artists like the Van Goghs of the world wouldn't have to uh, starve to death or kill themselves or whatever. You know, like we could have people serve, not just surviving, but thriving through being able to create their artwork while not necessarily having the capability of doing job related things that uh, people who may not be as artistically minded end up doing. But the point here is, is that we wanna have that, but at the same time, we do wanna have an incentive for people to try to be the best person that they could possibly be. And sometimes it does take a lot of struggling against whatever obstacles happen to be thrown uh, thrown our way just like today i was doing squats and i applied more weights than i did the last time in order to you know in order to get through some kind of challenge and that's like uh that i think is going to keep the uh ship up but uh how much is that also being talked about as far as the philosophies that are being uh discussed at uh, burning man that we have to have something and maybe this is it maybe the struggle that we're going through right now is a certainly a part of it but how much is that being talked about as far as we should be able to go through some kind of a struggle in order to then come out much better you gotta be anti-fragile you want so i i always think uh you know because I, I i can i can go at things like cramps sometimes if i see a problem sometimes i i approach certain problems like i would approach a cramp where i go in there very aggressively i put in a lot of pressure is I'm trying to break up the lactic acid. And then that's how you cure the cramp. But a lot of people, they're sort of like, they'll confuse that for bullying or something, right? Mm -hmm. When really it's like, I'm not trying to hurt people. I'm trying to make them stronger. Like I'm trying to activate anti-fragility or I'm trying to activate post-traumatic growth, not post-traumatic stress. Because I feel like it's sort of like when wolves and stuff roughhouse with each other. Right. They're not doing that because they're fighting and because they don't know how to get along. It's actually because they get along so well that when a bigger predator comes along, they're that prepared. Yeah, no, I believe um, the human condition does benefit from some sort of uh, competition and incentive structure. Uh, I just think that there needs to be a minimum basic lifestyle so that people aren't cheating and stealing just to survive. Uh, so, and it, it also, you know, the worry from the propagandists when they just want to steal the money will be, oh, then if everybody gets money, we'll have a population explosion and blah, blah, blah. No, Western societies tend to have less births and we are sustaining as far as growth rates. So we just need to get... Uh, a level playing field and then really focus on sustainability and bringing down um, the, the carbon and all the pollutants and the fact that our oceans are dying and all of that as soon as possible so that we can uh, live in an environment where half of society is at the, is at the, at the, at the base. And then the people who want to strive and, uh, you know, get on airplanes and fly around the world or have a boat or whatever, uh, they still need to compete and do better things. Well, I definitely like the fact that here in the U.S. we have all these uh, different 50 states that were in a way meant to be a ground for different kinds of experimentation, where one state could do something, the rest of the states could look at it and say, hey, this is working out, or hey, in California, all the businesses are going away and going to uh, Texas right now. So people do make decisions based on whatever it is that they're offered. The thing that I'm the most scared of, and this goes back to the thing we were talking before about decentralization, which I am a huge fan of. What I do not want, and I'll say this outright, I don't want a new Chairman Mao, like they're having in China right now with their system. 
like for all the propaganda that gets espoused from uh, the Chinese side, they have a system where everybody is controlled, where everybody has social credit. If you say something bad about the government, they're going to throw you in a cage. If you uh, do something that they're against, they're going to lower your credit score. You're not going to be able to get out of the country. So that's what happens in the top-down society. So what I want to definitely avoid is that. And uh, do you have any advice for going forward, making the right decisions, making sure we Lev. don't end up in that situation? Lev, and I just wanted to interject because we were talking about having that base level where mm -hmm. we, we want like you were talking about leveling the playing field and you're talking about how birth rates aren't going up there our population is kind of uh uh at us i guess at an equilibrium or or something but i think it's the costs of living keep going up like the real estate taxes keep going up the cost of milk keeps going up the mm -hmm. cost of education everything's the prices are going up so it's not that people don't want to have kids is that they can't afford to have kids. Like the medium wage has been the same since the 70s, right? The medium wage has been around $30,000 since the 70s, but the cost of living keeps going up. Okay, so it's simple math. If two people get married, uh, they can have two kids <laughs> because it's two plus two, and then you keep it there. And then X amount of people aren't gonna get married and have kids. So it's probably like 2.3 or something. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert at this, but a lot of people just, you know, enjoying life more and they're having kids later. So, uh, and then that's expensive society. to have kids. I, so it, it's one or the other, right? I think it's either that it's the life is getting so good and technology is getting so good that people don't want it anymore, or it's that it's actually, more and more and more expensive to have a kid, right? As in we're getting crushed between these millstones of high inflation and rising taxes, and it disproportionately affects people in the middle and lower classes than in the upper class. Well, this is because right? the and then, wealth is being funneled off to a big black hole um, called the 0.01%. So, but that shouldn't matter so much because the economy is not a finite pie. So it's not like... If so and so well, has the prices X are going amount, up, not because of supply and demand, and if there's more automation going into the process, then it should be the prices should be coming down. If if it's it's yes. cheaper to deliver that milk to your table because a robot milks the cow, <laughs> and then a robot puts it on the truck, and then the truck is brought to a, a, a supermarket then it's, the prices should be coming down. But they're not because our broken capitalist system is shareholder value and the investors in shareholder value paradigm need to get more and more wealthy because the wealthy person next to them is getting more and more wealthy and that person wants a bigger boat. Like that's the bullshit that capitalism turned into. I'm, I'm right there with you because our capitalist system is broken. And mm -hmm. I think why it's broken is not the incentives. The reason it's broken is because of the laws that are in place. The I laws think that, that were in place that were bought by the powerful because they had the yes. money and the lobbyists yes. and mm -hmm. yes. all of that. Yes. So, so that's the paradigm yes. we're playing with. And uh, a simple yeah. amendment could fix that. If, yeah, so Milton Freeman, Milton Freeman talks about this in a book called Free to Choose, which I would, I would, I could die a happy man if I died tomorrow, and I knew that you were going to read the book Free to Choose. I would feel like I potentially made the world a better place, that I've saved people's lives. And Free okay. to Choose, he talks about the system, and at the end, he proposes an economic amendment to the Constitution, saying if, if we were to define, he says, here's a draft. He says, I'm not an expert on how to write this, but here's the starting point and other people can run with it. He says, if we were to pass an amendment to the Constitution that laid out what government was and was not allowed to do to affect the economy, that you would be able to single-handedly reform all of these wonky incentives that we're lamenting right now, where people are keep trying to keep up with the Joneses and get a bigger boat and store all their money in these black holes, 
where if you were to, I think it's immoral to pass a law that hurts five people to help one person, right? And I think it's much more important for government to not try to do good, but government should put all its attention into not trying to do evil. Because uh, well, I think good intentions, I think good in it, what you're talking about, um, FDR and the New Deal, right? Was a was a. No, I'm not talking about not talking about FDR, but what, he's what, all what, it's all connected. Let's go get historical, right? So, you know, 240 years ago, they wrote a constitution that was supposed to be against oligarchy, right? And then, it was a decentralizing document. Yeah, yeah, that was against oligarchy. And then uh, you know the oligarchs snick, you know, snuck in and you know did all the things that the wealthy tend to do. And then FDR and and social safety nets and all of those things were enacted. And then since then, the accountants, the lawyers, the the wealth uh, gatherers uh, got to work on poking holes in that. And now we, you know, talking about. You know, Chairman Mao and socialism's evils when, uh, I mean, Chairman Mao isn't a communist. He's a dictator, uh, or was. Um, and uh, But you agree that's something we got to watch out for as well. Like, while we're trying to do good, we got to make sure somebody like that doesn't go into power that's able to have a top-down control over all society. Good intentions, good intentions aren't good enough. Like, your good intentions don't matter, right? It's all about the effects of your actions. Yeah, right? I mean, like if someone wants, life, we're we're in a beautiful time when, um, and I am in, I am in horror of what's going on now. But we did need things to get really bad before they got better. And the good news is, somebody who was just at the youth climate march the other day was the kids are learning. Civics is cool again. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I mean, the the powers that be got to work on our education system and took civics out of uh, of the discussion so people wouldn't know how the sausages were made. The Electoral College is racist. It is about the race, the, the, the slaveholding um, states having as much power as the, the northern cities. So we've got to get back to a real democracy as it was in that, that intended 240 years ago they put the electoral college in there as a negotiation. They couldn't do a complete democracy back then because they didn't want a direct democracy. I yeah. I, I would never get rid of the electoral. I would never get rid of the electoral college. I think that's essential. Well, no, the electoral college is now um, not doing what they're what they said it was supposed to do was they said that you can't trust the rabble. So we're going to put this one layer in between in case. It's to protect against idiot. tyranny of the majority. It's to protect against tyranny of the majority. Uh, it uh, The tyranny of the majority. So um, how about a tyranny? That's why they put it in there. How about a tyranny of the minority? Uh, because that's what exactly happened when 46% of people voted for somebody who was obviously unqualified for the office and the electorals, the electors did not act like it was supposed to. They were supposed to be a check on mad stupidity happening. And they, they, they now are just now. They now do not think like the electoral college was supposed to. If you could bring back, it's a safeguard against it. Great, but these people are lockstep what uh, they're getting voted to do. It, and I, when when North and South Dakota have as much have double the power that California does, we are not in a democracy. Well, we've become more and more federalized as it has become less and less about state rights and more and more about the federal government. I feel like we've been going in the wrong direction towards what you call broken capitalism for decades. And you brought up FDR. I, I think that FDR and the, and the New Deal was not a good thing. I think that it hurt social, a lot of the people. Social security? I, think, I don't, I think that that's a Ponzi scheme and I think that we're never going to get it. Well, just know that um, democracy, one person, one vote. Uh, you know, when we talk about the, the, the logic that happened back then in the horse and buggy days 
and the states having power to deal with their own issues in the age of muskets uh, was one thing. People do not consider themselves a Missourian before they consider themselves an American now. So times have changed and the whole making, you know, colored people three a three-fifths of a human, uh, non-equal rights for women, which by the way is still in the constitution. Women do not have, there is no equal rights amendment. Um, these things have to get changed because we were dealing with a time when women were not equals and where uh, uh, African Americans were three fifths of a human and electoral college came directly as a negotiating tactic just to get the votes 200 and whenever years ago that that was uh, uh, implanted. But anyway, let's agree to disagree on that because it's- uh, I never, I, I sure, but I always tell people I never agree to disagree. I just make a mental note to try to come back to it later because I feel like that's where a lot of harm happens in our society is people decide to be intransigent and then they miss the opportunities to actually get to the bottom of things. Well, I'm just, I'll be a little edgy here as a Democrat or as a liberal activist. Um, when large amounts of people in, in, in more educated states like California and New York don't vote because it doesn't freaking matter because they're automatically going to be Democrats, that sucks, right? I want everybody to vote. Um, I, you know, everybody, even in the, even in the less educated states, everybody should vote. Um, what about yeah. uh, 16 year olds? I, I remember hearing, uh, there was somebody talking about lowering the vo voting age to 16. I think it should be lowered to 15 or uh, any point where people are thinking about it. In fact, um, people that are younger have more life to live. The, the plan, you know, the future is more their issue. I mean. The fact that um, senile, you know, octogenarians vote at a greater rate than 18-year-olds, um, and I mean, that's terrible. I was very inspired at the Youth Climate March to see so many um, activated young people, and li literally, since you put voting machines mostly in schools, how insane is it? that adults are going to schools to vote and the kids in the schools can't vote. The old Do you think it would be a good idea to have a, a one world government? I was just reading uh, Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens and he was talking about our whole system and how human rights aren't real and the government gives us our rights. And I, I've been listening a lot to Destiny on Twitch and uh, Hassan Piker from the Young Turks. And these are all guys who think that in the future, like the natural evolution of government should be like a global coalition. Like if there was a way that we could centralize in some form a way so that, you know, we could pool the world's resources and collaborate. And it, and it, it's, it's like, a it's a, it's a unite the world. I mean, that's um, the way it's done in Star Trek. They look pretty happy in Star Trek. Right. Mm, so, mm. um, so just like what I said about the horse and buggy days and states' rights versus federal rights, uh, we're now beyond the, I mean, we're now in a globalist society. And it, as long as it is, um, it is a truly evolved leadership structure, and really we're, we're already too late. I mean, the, the fact that the UN um, is so broken with, uh, despotic regimes having like veto power over, uh, you know, well-educated organizations. Um, it, it's, it would be great if there was a coordinating entity for the purposes of global issues and that they had real strength. I mean, one I had a semi positive thing about China is if they want to solve environmentalism, they could fucking do it. Um, we're gonna go just open a lot of coal plants. They just, they just, they just started a bunch of coal plants, like totally outpacing ours. Like, they, was it two hundred yeah, coal yeah, plants? Or something? They're, they're still in a wealth gathering. Um, I mean, they're also choking on it's, coal dust. But my point isn't 
about China. My point is that um, dictatorships can turn on a dime. If we need evolve, we need uh, evolved leadership that doesn't have to talk about things for 20 years. So anyway, this is not necessarily my ballywick. So uh, I'd like to move back to arts and culture. I, I do have to get running fairly soon, actually. It's four o'clock. Before uh, that, let me just say uh, one thing real quick. Regardless of whatever disagreements you guys may have, I think the important thing going forward is that we're able to learn from each other. And that if we're able to pass on a book like uh, Jules had recommended Free to Choose, and you could recommend the book to Jules, I think that going over that kind of stuff, regardless of whatever age we happen to be or whatever ideological camps we happen to be in, whatever, that stuff doesn't matter to me in the least. Because the only thing that does matter is if, like you're saying, there is, a, you know, the time, time's ticking, the oceans aren't getting any better right now, there's problems going on with the bee population, which I want to work to solve. There's all kinds of things that are going on which we can work together on. But I think the first step is being able to take that time, just like those kids. Like, I really hope that those kids who you were talking about, the 15-year-olds, that they could have two books in front of them. One book says one thing, the other book says a different thing. Their professor, teacher, whatever tells them, you know what, first I'm going to teach you how to think. I teach you how to think and then you could read and then you could do your research, but that's going to be the first part. And the more wisdom we can inspire in each other, I think the better. So facts and a historical precedence are you know, science and knowledge. The reason we're not still clubbing each other over the head uh, for, uh, around the, the drinking hole in Africa is because we wrote things down, mm, right? Because of culture, yeah, culture. And and uh, and then we learned to farm because we had to, uh, and that's when we learned to you know, we learned to 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 collaborate a little bit on on hunting that was useful, but really farming. Uh, is when society started happening and pa tr passing knowledge down. And the knowledge was like, okay, so this is a good time to, to plant your crops, uh, you know, X amount of days after winter, uh, you know, when the sun is over there, because these were facts, right? You could look at the horizon and this is the way my dad did it. This is the way my granddad did it. This is the way it works best. This is the best yield. Those are facts. When you're talking about two books, if one is being funded by propagandists, um, they might even believe what they're doing, but they're taking their facts from hokum, from guys that haven't done their homework, but they really like Rush Limbaugh. Don't give that book to the kids. I mean, that's my opinion. The kids, I mean, the dictatorships, cloud facts so they can maintain control and they can leaderships to the government right because it's so i think government's in the way i think we would solve our climate issues with a free market i think that a lot of the problems that we are feeling the heat from and we feel like the clock is ticking i think that the free market would solve these problems so the fast. free market like so here's an example of the free market coal plants that dump all of their coal uh um refuse into uh streams or into valleys that get flooded that go into streams that's the free that's the unregulated free market and the uh, amount of mercury that gets into the ground water that makes its way to the oceans it kills off coral reefs that, that end up in uh, changing the amount of oxygen in the ecosystem, that's the free market. The free market is dead because we can't take that anymore or will be dead. So we do need controls around environmentalism and wealth disparity and all of these other things and the ability to lie to everybody so you can get more wealth. I mean, free. these are all free markets. And so how do we get to... I mean, socialized good, if you will. Well, Jeff Bezos recently increased his wages when Bernie Sanders called him out. And I think that's a perfect example of how society codifies behavior. Like the reason why a lot of us treat people in certain ways and regard people in certain ways is not because we're legally required to, 
but it's because our culture and society like punishes and rewards us for behaving in certain ways. And if you were in a free market society, we didn't have broken capitalism, we didn't have crony capitalism, we passed an amendment that said what the government is and isn't allowed to do, and then you see bad actors doing things that, hey, technically it's legal, right? Like there's a lot of technically legal things that if you can pinpoint them, you can go like, you're messing up people's lives. Like if it was legal to make people psychologically ill and that was your intention, and then people, called you out on it, they might not be able to try you in court, but they could shame you. They could make people more aware of the bad acting behavior. And then people would change the behavior and not because it was court ordered. Um, I mean, you, you just touched on the healthcare system. So free market healthcare where literally, I, I, you know, maybe they've changed the names of it. Yeah, they, 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 well, when you're in a situation where a whole department is trying to find loopholes to keep people from getting health care because that's losses on their books, when they have to pay out an insurance claim, um, when they have to pay out an insurance claim, that is a loss on their books. That is so, uh, you know, I'm somebody who um, uh, is no longer a wealthy guy. I have a neck injury. I can't get a, a new um, uh, uh, new scan because that won't be covered. That would be thousands of dollars out of my pocket. So the wealthy will have better health than the average people. So uh, free markets does not work in healthcare. It it needs to be socialized. Uh, it, it does work to a certain extent in terms of competition for pharmaceuticals and for development. You know, the brains still need to compete and and get some uh, some capitalism for spending all of those hours working overnight and et cetera. There has to be incentives to, to bring genius about. But then when it's shareholder value and funneling the cash to to the Caymans, be, by keeping that person from getting their uh, their PET scan, um, that's that's not what Europe does, where people are happy. So anyway, without getting into this, let's get back to the happiness because right. no, this is happy. This is arts and culture and how uh, the like this the Scandinavian countries are more happy than we are. Um, I think but that's because of how we treat each other and our music and our culture. And like a lot of people, like I've watched shows and they're like, oh, nobody's happy. And then people, you are the story you tell yourself, right? Like I have my own personal experiences of things I've tested in the laboratory of my own mind, right? And I, my heart resonates so much when you say, like, you don't want to listen to people who have had their brains just totally muddied by propaganda. And I feel like that is a very sobering and scary thing to imagine, that there are people with a lot of power and a lot of influence and a lot of passion who, with the best intentions, right, feel like they're fighting for their life, but it's only because they've been misled by propaganda, right? And so I think it's really important to look at the source of your information and who's funding that information. But I do it a different way than I was taught in school, right? So I was taught in school, you should always look at the author first, figure out who funded the author, figure out his biography first before you start to read it. And I do it the opposite way. As in, I'll read a book or I'll read an article or I'll like engage with someone's thoughts fully and then I'll go, okay, now what's this guy's story, right? And I feel like that's how I don't prime myself with an initial bias so that I can, because I think it's possible to compare things, right? And I think that when I hear that we need to socialize medicine, I'm like, you're either right or you're wrong, right? It's one or the other, right? Socializing healthcare is either the answer to our problems, and that's what would save my life, so right? Or it's actually and historical death precedents, and it's great that I'm talking to intellectuals that want to hear all the ideas. Um, the problem, I mean, and it's and you guys are young, so you have the time. <laughs> uh, the problem is when you don't have the time, and uh, and you're just on your car because you're working three jobs, 
and you get your 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 data from Rush Limbaugh, um, then that's a fucking problem. Okay, so it's you great. The and, and the New York intellectual sector, yep, you know this is what uh, intellectuals have done time immemorial. Let's talk about outrageous ideas and poke holes in it, but. I mean, no, uh, I don't, we don't have time anymore because of the environmental catastrophe to dick around with the propagandists and it, it all comes back to it. But just getting back to the Sweden model and, and facts, right? Uh, healthcare works better in every single industrialized nation over us. It's a fucking fact. And anybody who like is disputing that um, is is out to lunch. So um, so <laughs> does that include a scalability, though? Like the one thing that I'm curious about with this whole discussion is that people are comparing places of different size, different population and a different history, like taking a look at, for example, Singapore, which is a tiny island and they are able to uh, take care of their own as far as something like healthcare goes. And then comparing that to a much larger place like the United States, which is why I'm a big fan of the state's model, where we can have different experiments happening in different states, then let people decide where they want to live. When there was East Germany and West Germany, one side was going to the other, not the so other the way around. The scalability model is of interest. Um, but just it just keeps getting back to the whole bullshit trickle down economics theory that if you if you give the money to the rich people it'll trickle down, um, which never fucking happened. They put it in the Caymans, making you know fifteen percent rather than putting it back into factories in the Midwest where they have to give health care to obese Americans. You know, so the fact that that uh, healthcare is a uh, is on the stock exchange where people are trying to take home profits um, is is broken. So uh, so yes, these are smaller countries. These are uh, countries that don't have poverty because they didn't import slaves for two hundred years, right? Uh, so we have a bigger issue. But I mean, this whole thing about American exceptionalism, which is a term that mostly I think is ignorant. Um, you, nobody can think American is exceptional if we cannot do exceptional things anymore. And I'd, well, like, to leave, I'd like to leave you on this note because I do have to go now. America used to create amazing public works. You walk around New York City, you see massive buildings that were created on the public dime. I mean, we we... You know, places like China have high-speed rail. Like, we sh cannot continue to have these airplanes flying around. They're the biggest polluting things. And I would much prefer I – mean, you could get to Washington, D.C. much faster through high-speed rail without going to the airport and having to take your shoes off and all that crap. But we cannot do any of these things anymore because of the broken paradigm we live in. So – we we American is no longer exceptional, and to be exceptional, we have to look at facts. We have to look at what other people do, and and build on it. And yes, figure out our problems because we've dug ourselves a bunch of holes. But we know that some things work for other people, and to say, well, it's not going to work for us because of this, and then go to the complete opposite of what works for other people in no country. Does anything that looks like our healthcare system work? But well, as far as social programs in England, let's say, like back in the early 20th century when they instituted them, if they didn't institute those programs, I bet that England would have gone full communist. It was a really uh, terrifying uh, time. So uh, people could have chosen that other route and they would have become just like uh, well, Soviet Russia. The time we're in, I'm going to sign off with this, is we do have mostly 100% global connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, there is sunlight now. There are young people like you that are, are pushing the envelope, hopefully getting your generation to get the fuck off the couch and vote because this is your planet now. And, you know, there's old crusty activists like me that will keep carrying my signs. Um, <laughs> and But really... 
when 80% of old people vote and 30% of young people vote and the young people will inherit the earth, you got to own that shit now. So go I agree. ahead and own it and, and think about the happiness quotient. What really makes people happy? And this is where I come from. Community, art, love, fun. And when you're making shit tons of money and your family hates you and all the things that like extreme wealth typically gets them, that's not the thing anymore. And so really, let's look at the happiness quotient. Um, and uh, we here in New York, in my section of the universe, will be trying to do that bringing uh, art, happiness uh, to everybody. And, showing and I'll be trying to do that too. And, and so we'll, will Jules.